speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. George Reeves, known to millions as TV Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet? Not on the night of June 16, 1959. The night Reeves was found dead at the age of 45. Sprawled naked on his bed with a gunshot wound to the head. Police called it a suicide, but was it? He was murdered. There's no question about it. No one will ever convince me, I know they never convinced Helen, his mother, that he took his own life. On this episode of Mysteries and Scandals, we'll examine that fateful night, the night America lost the superhero. We'll also feature exclusive interviews with some of Reeves' Superman co-stars, including the original Jimmy Olsen. That uh, there was a hit man who secretly came in the house and murdered George. That did not happen. And we'll hear from the two actresses who played Superman's love interest, Lois Lane. It's hard for me to accept that he did commit suicide. We were just stunned because having just seen him and he was happy, we were going to work again and uh, gone. The story of Superman's mysterious death will be told through rare photographs and archival footage. Plus, we'll recreate the death of George Reeves and try to figure out who was holding the gun that killed the superhero. Was it his nightclub singer fiance, afraid she was about to be jilted? Did his older married lover hire a hitman to bring him down? Or did a drunk and despondent Superman just decide it was time to throw in the cape? I'm A.J. Benza. Join me as we take a look at the mysterious death of Superman on this stroll down the flip side of the Walk of Fame. Immortalized as Superman, George Reeves' ashes are here in this mausoleum near his childhood home of Southern California. Even in death, Reeves cannot escape his overbearing mother. His ashes bookended for eternity between his mother and his aunt. It's no surprise that Helen Besselow wanted her ashes to rest beside her only son forever and always. The one fact regarding Reeves' early life that everyone agrees upon is that his mother worshipped George to the point of smothering him. Reeves had something of a chaotic childhood. His parents divorced when George was just a baby. Mother and son eventually moved to Pasadena, California, where George discovered his calling in the theater. Film historian Jim Beaver explains. He fell in love with theater and acting and uh, did um, a great number of plays there in Pasadena uh, all through the late 30s. While he was in a play, he was spotted by a casting director and auditioned for and got a role in Gone with the Wind, which was, at least in a way, the beginning of his professional career. Not a bad gig to start off your professional career, huh? So Reeves was just one of many actors to get his start here at the famous Pasadena Playhouse, training ground to such luminaries as William Holden, Gene Hackman, and Dustin Hoffman. Anyhow, he takes this job on Gone with the Wind. He was to play one of the red-headed Tarleton twins, Two southern gentlemen both vying for the attentions of the beautiful Scarlett O'Hara. The other brother was played by Fred Crane. We were both ecstatic about getting the part together because it was the first thing that either one of us had done in motion picture. To celebrate, Reeves suggested a night on the town, indulging in one of his favorite hobbies, drinking. We had Navy grogs and zombies and puka puka punches and ate brumaki and we were sitting next to a very fine gentleman. Uh, and uh, we uh, made a lot of noise and we got off the chairs after we were through and we walked out on our knees. Hollywood took notice of the handsome newcomer from Gone with the Wind. Reeves was cast opposite Claudette Colbert in the 1943 war picture So Proudly We Hail, directed by Mark Sandrich. Just as his career was moving into high gear, he joined the war effort and enlisted in the army. Sandrich assured the young actor he would make him a movie star when his tour of duty ended. By the time George got out of the army, which he had entered before the film was released, uh, Mark Sandrich was dead. And George always said during the Superman years that if Mark Sandrich hadn't died, he wouldn't be sitting there now in his monkey suit. But it was that monkey suit that brought George Reeves fame and with it frustration. Reeves still dreamed of film stardom and he was embarrassed of his Superman success, but was he depressed enough to end it all? Just ahead, we'll introduce the two women in George's life. 
Was it one of his lovers who proved the Man of Steel was simply flesh and blood? That's a call I've been waiting for, Miss Lane. Everything's been taken care of, except you. No, I don't believe it. You will, Blinky. You will. Superman, the classic 50s TV show that made George Reeves a household name. I'm A.J. Benz, and welcome back to Mysteries and Scandals, and I'll look back at the mysterious death of Superman. After World War II, George Reeves scrounged around Hollywood for film roles. And then in 1951, his chiseled good looks and muscular physique won him the lead role of Superman on television. He accepted the role for the oldest reason in the book. He needed the dough. Besides, Reeves was convinced the last thing America wanted to see was a grown man running around in tights. He was wrong. The series was a thundering success. Phyllis Coates, who played Lois Lane during that first season, remembers meeting her co-star. George invited me over with Izzy Burns, who was the was George's wardrobe man. He also took care of me too, because I only had two suits. He had one for in case I got egg on one. So George made us a martini, and uh, he said, "Here's to the bottom of the barrel." And that was how I first met George. George was typecast in the Superman mm -hmm. role. I was typecast as Jimmy Olsen, and I wanted to get back into films too, and I only had a bow tie and a sweater to worry about. He had the Superman insignia and uh, what he called the monkey suit. But every year he would use the monkey suit to the delight of some needy child. Superman historian Jim Hambrick recalls one of Reeves' annual rituals. At the end of every season, uh, George would cut the S out of, uh, out of his costumes and send the S's to kids in the hospital or somebody's birthday or whatever and destroy uh, the rest of the costume. Clark, aren't they the cutest puppies you ever saw? They sure are, but did you ever see a puppy that wasn't cute? Off screen, Reeves' life was exactly the opposite of the mild-mannered Clark Kent he played on TV. George enjoyed a long-time affair with a wealthy society woman by the name of Tony Mannix. There was only one little problem. Tony was very married to an MGM executive, Eddie Mannix. Hollywood kryptonite author Nancy Schoenberger fills us in. George Reeves' 10-year romance with Tony Mannix was an open secret in Hollywood. She had the kind of arrangement with her, with her husband that allowed her to uh, go after what she wanted. Eddie was an important guy at MGM, a vice president. They were in a high um, echelon of Hollywood society. Eddie knew about their relationship and approved of it. He'd fallen in love with... Uh, Tony, they married, they were all devout Catholic. There was never to be a divorce, but there was, I believe, quite a bit of sinning and uh, uh, a lot of confession on Sunday morning, yes. He called her Ma, and uh, they were a great twosome, and she was very good to George. She bought the house, it was quite nice, you know, she really gave George a good start. She called him the boy. <laughs> and she took very good care of him. Very good indeed. This trendy British roadster was also a gift from the generous Tony Mannix. Their affair continued for a decade until just one year before his death, when a flashy New York nightclub singer blew into his life. Her name was Lenore Lemon. I kid you not. George said she was beautiful. And she was quite beautiful. But pretty is as pretty does, and Lenore had a pretty unsavory reputation, according to Superman historian Jan Henderson. She was known for being 86 from certain clubs for brawling over men. Uh, typical thing you wouldn't think would go in in cafe society. But that didn't matter to George. The guy was head over heels. Gene LaBelle was a personal friend of George Reeves. And then he said, look, I love the woman. If she wanted a lighter cigarette with a $100 bill, I'd give her the $100 bill. George and Lenore announced their plans to marry. George's longtime lover, Tony Mannix, was not pleased. Shortly after that, I heard from Tony <laughs> about Leonor Lemon. She wanted me to talk to George. He wanted me to talk to the boy. And I said, he's a big boy, and that's not, you know, I don't feel that's appropriate. Tony was more beautiful than... Uh, than <laughs> George was ever handsome, and uh, he was a lucky guy, I thought. 
But George's luck was about to run out. Not even the Man of Steel was up to the task of keeping Lenore in line. For one thing, she had a temper when she drank. And pretty soon, George's close friends stopped coming around. She wasn't the kind of person that you fall in love with. She was, she's the kind of a person that wants to run your life. And if that wasn't enough, Lenore was rumored to have connections to the mob back in her native New York. She was well known as a uh, party girl. And uh, she was involved with Hoffa and all of that. Look what happened to Hoffa. Yeah, and look what happened to George. At least they found his body. But was Lenore Lemon responsible? Or did Reeves make the decision to end it all? When we come back, we'll take a look at all the theories surrounding that deadly night in 1959 when Superman bit the bullet after this. Welcome back. I'm A.J. Benza at the famous Chasen's restaurant where TV Superman had his last supper. It was June 16, 1959, and Chasen's was the hot spot in town. As always, the place was packed with showbiz bigwigs. Spirits were high, liquor was flowing. George Reeves was there with his fiancée, the tempestuous party girl, Lenore Lemon. Just hours later, the Man of Steel was found dead, naked, and alone in his bedroom. The newspaper headlines the next morning stunned America. The official word was that Reeves died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. When he died, everybody was obviously in shock, all the kids our age. It was a big thing on schoolyards. You go to school that day and every kid was rattled. George's close friends weren't buying the suicide story. According to Superman historian John Field, Reeves had too much to live for. He was going to direct another season of Superman coming up another 26 episodes of Superman. He was going to direct a science fiction feature with Phyllis Coates. He said, I have a script. It's a science fiction script, and I'm in the guild now, and I'm going to direct this, and I'd like you to do the lead, would you? And uh, he was very up about that. He looked wonderful. George had always been a big drinker, and maybe all the booze was beginning to take its toll. The autopsy revealed an alarming 0.27 alcohol level when he died. That's a lot of cocktails, even for Superman. This amount of alcohol, which was extremely substantial uh, in a case like this, um, I think contributed more to what happened than to any of the sinister things that have been speculated upon. And that is uh, a depressed enough state where he could take his own life. Uh, a man comes in, sits down on his bed, and slumps with his head tilted to one side, fires a bullet through his head, and hitting the ceiling. This fellow called me up, listened to the radio, George has just committed suicide. And I said, baloney. So if it wasn't a suicide, how did Reeves die? One of the most outlandish stories is that Tony Mannix, George's married lover, hired a hitman to knock him off. The scenario goes like this. Neighbor William Bliss dropped by Reeves' home late that night. When Lenore Lemon went downstairs, heard the doorbell, opened the door, was chatting with Bill Bliss at the front door, the gunman who had been waiting for his opportunity went upstairs, shot George, and escaped out of a, an upper story bedroom. Uh, the great mystery to us was, was Bill Bliss there by accident or by design? The idea that Lenore Lemon stood at the door talking with William Bliss while someone sneaked in the back door of George's house and crept up the stairs is ludicrous. Now let's take a look at the Lenore Lemon theory. Rumors were rampant that George was thinking about calling off their marriage. Did Lenore catch wind of it and fly off the handle? I would bet my life on it that Lenore Lemon came up there, got a gun, and shot him. He wants to go to bed. She's wired, she doesn't want to go to bed, and he ignores her. She gets the gun, shoots five holes in the floor. He doesn't react to it, and then puts one on the, at his head, thinking the gun was empty, and blew his brains out. I think she did it because she was inebriated. Uh, I don't know what happened that night. No one knows what happened that night. Well, we do know one thing. Superman was dead and the investigation that followed was a joke. Did the police just drop the ball or did some big shot Hollywood insider tell the cops to back off? When we return, we'll take a look at that Boston investigation and a grieving mother's fight to save her son's reputation.
The end of the line for the Man of Steel and the mystery surrounding George Reeves' violent death remains. I'm A.J. Benza. Welcome back to Mysteries and Scandals. No one who was close to George Reeves, not even his possessive mother, Helen, bought the suicide theory. Here's some reasons why. Number one, there were no fingerprints on the gun. Number two, there were no powder burns on the body. Number three, the shell casing was found under the corpse. And the best reason of all, there were five random bullet holes later found in George's bedroom. A distraught Tony Mannix, Reeves' longtime lover, called his co-star Phyllis Coates with the news. She said, the boy is dead. There are five random bullet holes around the room. The gun's been wiped clean and the sheets are in the bending. I said, my God, what? Where? She said, you've got to go over to the house with me. Well, who knows who put the sheets in the washing machine? That was just one of the strange things that happened at Reeves' home. For example, George's fiance, Lenore, returned to the scene after the police split. It was later discovered that Lenore Lemon had broken the seal to go in the house to get food out of the refrigerator and booze out of the home. And also uh, traveler's checks that George had written in his name for them to use on a vacation. Lenore's little escapade wasn't the only bizarre happening following the death of Superman. The police investigation seemed to be bungled from the beginning. No photos of the crime scene had ever been found, and Reeves' body was embalmed before the autopsy was performed. George's mother, Helen, was irate. She was also determined to salvage her son's reputation. Private investigator Milo Spiriglio worked on the Reeves case. He remembers Helen's determination to prove her son was murdered. She had his body frozen. It was put in a train back to their hometown. Uh, at that point, a second autopsy was performed and it was concluded during the second autopsy that there was a probability of homicide. A probability, but no hard proof. There were those who believed that Eddie Mannix, Tony's husband, used his power as an MGM executive to put a lid on the police inquiry. The last thing Mannix wanted was to have his wife involved in a scandal. Hey, money talks, especially in Hollywood. It was one of the sloppiest investigations ever. Back in those days, they wanted to protect celebrities particularly the studios, they were very powerful in uh, Hollywood at the time. So, Tony Mannix's name stayed out of the newspapers, but her involvement with Reeves certainly wasn't over, as Jack Larson discovered when he and Tony went to George's house just a few days after his death. I saw and recognized that there was old blood of George's, and I began to get a bit sick. And at that point, I heard a tap, tap, and tap, tap. And she was tapping up these blessings on the bullet holes. Go figure. Although her behavior was strange, there was no evidence to connect Tony Mannix to the death of George Reeves. I believe that Tony Mannix would never in a million years have killed George Reeves. If Tony was going to get rid of anybody, it would have been Lenore Lemon. And she really hated her. Now Reeves' other lady love, Lenore Lemon, is another story. She split town without even attending his memorial service. Classy gal. I think she looked on George's death, to a large extent, as a huge inconvenience in her life. One day we were talking back and forth, we were actually arguing, and she told me, do you want to hear that I killed George Reeves? I says, well, only if you did. Okay, I killed George Reeves. Are you satisfied? And she hung up on me. Sounds like a confession to me, but we'll never really know. No one, not even Lenore Lemon, was ever brought in for questioning. It smells like a cover-up. That's the $64,000 question. Who knows who pressured who to do what to cover this up? I felt the police were amateur time in Dixie. And poor Tony Mannix. The woman could never let go of George's memory. Edward Losey befriended Tony in her later years. He remembers the bizarre prayer session she held for George twice a week in her home. Usually on Tuesdays and Friday nights, we would actually kneel down together and hold hands, and she would start a prayer ceremony, a liturgy to him. Okay, but it does make you wonder how old George would like to be remembered after all these years. Not as Superman. <laughs> I think George would like to have been remembered as just a decent human being, a fun-loving, kind, generous, decent human being, which is what he was. I'm sure George would like to be remembered as Honest George, the people's friend. I always remember him as a southern gentleman. Mm -hmm. and he was so, so kind, such a gentleman, and uh, as opposed to so many people in this business, and he just couldn't be sweeter. 
George's impact on pop culture will forever be remembered here at the Superman Museum in Metropolis, Illinois, home of the superhero. And the people stopped the longest to see the George Reeves exhibit, to see the costume, which to a lot of fans of the show is like the Holy Grail. To this day, in this museum, the 200 people a day that come in here, the, the original, the real Superman is George Reeves, and will always be. Superman, who can change the course of mighty rivers, bend steel in his bare hands, and who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way. Truth? Justice? Well, we'll probably never know the truth or whether justice was served. But George Reeves and Superman will always be synonymous with the American way, forever remembered as our favorite superhero, Superman. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me the next time our paths cross on Mysteries and Scandals.